Good morning. I'm Councilmember Matthew Eugene, the chair of the Youth Services Committee. Thank you all for joining us for today's oversight hearing on DYCD Neighborhood Development Areas programs. As many of you know, the Neighborhood Development Areas program targets low-income neighborhoods to address poverty. While the national recession officially ended in 2009 and the United States economy recovered in many areas, such as the stock market and the unemployment rate, many New Yorkers are still struggling to get out of poverty. For example, in uh, 2015, the city's poverty rate was 19.9% compared to the national poverty rate of 18.4%. I was even more disappointed to learn that children were more likely to be poorer than adults. The city poverty rate for children under 18 was 22.8% and 18.6% for working adult age 18 to 65 years old. Not uh, surprisingly, Hispanic, Asian, and black New Yorkers had higher poverty rates where 24.6% of Hispanics, 23.4% of Asians, and 21.2% of black were living in poverty. Those numbers are too high and emphasize the need for all of us to do more to address our poverty in our great city of New York. We must recognize that children who grow up in neighborhoods with high poverty rates have poor outcome in health, education, employment, and earning potential. In fact, a child's chances of succeeding are severely diminished because growing up in a poor community where their family, peer workers, and communities at large can make them believe that academic or professional success is not possible. To address the chronic poverty in many of our neighborhoods, DYCD and DA programs are designed to provide residents with the skill, resources, and economic opportunities to help them become self-sufficient and get out of poverty. The NDA programs are located in neighborhoods with high poverty rates, and DYCD receives advice from community action board that are involved in community development effort and work with neighborhood advisory board. Currently, DYCD's NDA programs focus on four major areas. High school youth who are struggling academically or are at risk of dropping out, adult literacy, which includes adult basic education and high school equivalency test preparation, disconnected youth, and support services for seniors, immigrants, and program designed to keep families healthy. Many residents who live in neighborhood development areas responded to DYCD survey that allowed them to inform the agency on what was needed to improve the well-being of their communities. The founding of the survey were released earlier this year in DYCD Community Need Assessment Report. The results revealed that over half of young people did not know programs they were interested in were available or where they were located. Additionally, survey participants also indicated their neighborhood did not have programs available. The results of this survey were especially disappointing for me because the lack of knowledge of the available program should not be a reason for people. People are, are unavailable to participate in programs that will help provide, improve the economic, social, and political circumstances. There is too much at stake for young people not to take advantage of the many opportunities available to them. And I'm looking forward to hearing from DYCD how it addressed some of the issues the community highlighted in the Community Need Assessment Report. Before we begin, I would like to thank the community staff, our council, Kiu Gishu, 
policy analyst uh, Michael Benjamin, and senior financial analyst Jessica Ackerman, and my legislative and the budget director, Ethan Tucker. Thank you to all, all of you for what you do every single day for the young people in New York City. And uh, my consumer video? Okay. So now uh, the council will uh, now administer the vote. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony bef before this committee and to answer the committee's uh, questions honestly? Thank you. Can I get the statement? Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I'm Mike Bobbitt, Assistant Commissioner for Community Action Programs at the Department of Youth and Community Development at the DYCD. I am joined by Yvonne Harris, Director of the Neighborhood Development Areas, or NDA, Initiative, Community Action Programs. On behalf of Commissioner Bill Chung, we thank you for this chance to discuss DYCD's NDA Opportunity Youth supported work experience program. I will start my testimony today by discussing the Federal Community Services Block Grant, or CSVG, program, which funds the NDA Opportunity Youth Program. As the designated community action agency for New York City, DYCD administers CSVG funding to combat poverty and provides services to low-income people that empower them to become self-sufficient. New York City has received anti-poverty funding since the program's inception in 1964 as part of President Johnson's War on Poverty, and since 1996, DYC has served as a community action agency for New York City. Community action agencies administer funding for programs on a local level in accordance with the goals of the federal CSBG statute. DYCD uses its CSBG allocation for citywide programs and community-based programs that work to alleviate poverty. Citywide programs include the Fatherhood Initiative, services for immigrant families, and literacy services. Funding for community-based programs are distributed through 42 low-income communities designated as Neighborhood Development Areas, or NDAs. DYCD relies on poverty data from the Department of City Planning and defines NDAs as clusters of adjacent census tracts with 20% or more poor residents living at or below 125% of the poverty level. By targeting funds to NDAs, DYCD maximizes the impact of CSBG funding. The NDA initiative fosters neighborhood level engagement to ensure that the funded services address the most pressing needs of each community. A neighborhood advisory board, or NAB, in each NDA is tasked with representing the interests of local residents living in poverty. There are 12 seats on each NAB, half referred for appointment by local elected officials and half by DYCD. The NABs help determine the highest priority service areas for their respective NDAs by working with DYCD to carry out community needs assessments that solicit feedback through resident surveys, neighborhood town halls, and interviews with key stakeholders. In addition to the NAB, the Citywide Community Action Board advises DYCD on the administration of all CSBG funds throughout New York City. Currently, the NDA initiative allocates $15.6 million annually in CSBG funding to approximately 200 organizations that provide services to the residents of these targeted low-income neighborhoods. The services are funded by multi-year contracts awarded through a request for proposals process. Separate competitions were held for each service area that was determined to be a priority by the most recent community needs assessment in each particular NDA. The current NDA contracts were awarded in 2015 and based on the 2013 needs assessment. The seven current service areas within the NDA initiative include Opportunity Youth, Supportive Work Experience, Educational Support, High School Youth, Adult Literacy, Adult, adult uh, Basic Education and High School Equivalency and Test Prep, Seniors, Social, Cultural and Supportive Services, Housing, Advocacy and Assistance, Immigrants, Supportive Services, and Healthy Families, Support Services. 
These programs encourage youth to build academic skills and enroll in leadership, employment, and educational support programs, keeping them engaged in productive activities. They assist adults to obtain skills needed for employment and self-sufficiency. They help seniors maintain positive physical and social well-being, as well as obtain assistance, allowing them to remain in their own homes and continue living independently. And they stabilize vulnerable families as they receive assistance through case management on needs such as domestic violence prevention, substance abuse, HIV AIDS support services, child care, nutrition services, eviction prevention, and ensuring appropriate and safe housing. NDA initiative programs target low-income New York City residents as defined by the federal guidelines and who live within the boundary of each NDA. When DYCD developed the most recent NDA RFP in 2015, we determined that the service areas should continue to include some programs that serve youth. In addition to maintaining the educational support program for high school youth, we decided to develop another DYCD program to meet the diverse needs of the opportunity youth population, namely young people ages 16 to 24 who are not in school and not working. The NDA Opportunity Youth Program offers work readiness and life skills workshops and coaching, education and career counseling, one or more support activities in education and training support, mediation and conflict resolution, or peer counseling, and up to 140 hours of supported paid work experience that matches participants' interests and provides opportunities for career exploration. Each participant completes 10 hours of work experience a week for 14 weeks and is paid the minimum wage. We designed the NDA Opportunity Youth Program to be flexible, enabling it to serve a broader spectrum of youth, such as those with very low literacy levels and no work experience. The NDA Opportunity Youth Program was selected by 30 of the 42 NDAs to be a service area. Providers use a strengths-based approach, working in partnership with participants to build upon existing assets to reach their goals rather than fix problems. A case manager or counselor advocate meets once every two weeks with participants and programs make service referrals to help participants address other human services needs, service needs. Providers also assist youth in developing pro program plans for education and unsubsidized employment. Positive program outcomes include participants demonstrate gains in work readiness skills, participants develop career plans for continuing employment, education, advanced training or military service and an updated resume, participants enter employment and education program, advanced training program or military service. DYCD is committed to learning from and evaluating the NDA Opportunity Youth Program. For example, we have discovered that the largest segment of enrollees has included high school graduates with no work experience. Current participants have been placed in nearly 200 work sites to gain work experience in positions such as clerical aides, office assistants, teacher's aides, retail, sales, stock workers, and daycare and or after school program staff. A 2016 worksite employer survey revealed that 87.5% of worksite employers reported a very positive experience with the young people. 82.5% reported that they would invite the young person back for another internship. 97% report that they would participate in the program again as a worksite. 90% believe the program offered a unique chance for youth to gain professional work experience. For the current fiscal year, the NDA Opportunity Youth Program projects to serve 840 young people citywide. Last year, in fiscal 2017, 735 participants enrolled in the program and achieved the following outcomes. 145 participants entered employment and education program, advanced training, or military service. 307 participants exited the program with career plans for continuing employment education, occupational training, or military service with an updated resume. 277 participants demonstrated gains in work readiness skills. To demonstrate the program's positive impact, I'd like to share a few success stories. Sheila is a single mother with an inconsistent work history and has struggled to maintain a steady job. Sheila wanted to provide for her family and become a more reliable person. 
She was placed at Scans Lehman Village Cornerstone Community Center where she excelled and impressed management. After her internship was complete, she was offered the chance to apply for a group leader position. She worked with the NDA Opportunity Youth Program provider to create a cover letter and resume to highlight her relevant work experience. Sheila, who is now 25 years old, got the job and is still working at Scans Lehman Village Cornerstone. Juan, age 20, was seeking help to obtain employment. He was placed at Revolutionary Fitness where he refined his customer service skills. During his participation in the program, Juan attended a job fair where he was interviewed by Starbucks and hired. He worked with his youth counselor on time management strategies to allow him to complete the NDA Opportunity Youth Program while working at Starbucks. Juan continued to excel and is still working at Starbucks. Jason, age 19, dropped out of school because he was struggling academically and his friends were not a positive impact on him. He was placed at Scan's Lehman Village Cornerstone Community Center. He continued to work at Scan after completing the NDA Opportunity Youth Program through SYUP. Jason has enrolled in high school equivalency classes at Community Impact at Columbia University. After attending a recruiting event, he was hired as a sales associate at GameStop, which he considers to be his dream job. Maria is 21 years old and resides in the Bronx with her mother. Prior to enrolling in the program, Maria was out of school and unemployed. She graduated from Hostos High School in 2014. Maria was referred to the NDA Opportunity Youth Program by a former participant and was very eager to start. Her long-term goals are to work in an office setting or work with children. She began her internship at a Bronx Works after-school program site on September 5, 2017 and was recently offered employment as a youth counselor. The program has also helped her enroll at Bronx Community College, where she has started taking classes. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, DYCD's budget has doubled, and we have significantly expanded opportunities for young people across the city. We look forward to working with the City Council to continue providing programs for opportunity youth to build skills and obtain work experience. Thank you again for the chance to testify today. We're ready for any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you so very much. Uh, and I want to thank you also for being here for this very important uh, public hearing. And I want to take the opportunity also to thank uh, Ms. Aris. And I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. Uh, Uh, Commissioner, uh, related to the NDA program, do we have the NDA program in all the 42 areas designed, designated as the NDA areas? The, um, the NDA program operates in all 42 of the NDAs, they as you rightly pointed out. Part of the community needs assessment process for each NDA is to establish the highest priority needs. And so as a result of uh, what I was describing in my testimony, NABs doing street surveys, conducting the town hall meetings, interviewing uh, key stakeholders, the priorities are established. And so in the case specifically of Opportunity Youth, that is a program that's available in 30 of the 42 NDAs. So each NDA gets to uh, have a voice and a stake in what they consider to be the highest presenting needs for their neighborhood. And for th 30 of the 42, they selected Opportunity Youth as one of those priorities. So that means you got that 32 of those areas are served, right? 42 neighborhoods are served, yes. Yeah, so each will receive some set of um, services. Did you say 32 or 42? For, there are 42 NDAs in total. Oh, and 30 of the 42 selected NDA Opportunity Youth as one of the, um, one of the programs to be funded. Uh, you know, um, immigrant people, as you know, represent a big uh, section of our communities in New York City that, you know, I don't have to, to have a, to a long speech about that. So could you mention the different programs that are offered to immigrant young people or disadvantaged young people 
or immigrant people through sure. your, the program you are providing? Sure. So um, DYCD offers an array of, of opportunities uh, to, to serve and work with uh, immigrant youth. So as I mentioned in my testimony, NDA uh, immigrant services is an option. So certain communities wanted to provide targeted outreach to immigrant communities. So even within the NDA, that's a possibility. There are um, providers serving different target populations within Opportunity Youth itself. You know, so what, what's one example? Chinatown? Chinatown no. Manpower. Right. So Chinatown Manpower, for example, serves uh, immigrants, Chinese-speaking residents of their community. But as the chair is also well aware, even just outside of the, the NDA, we have other initiatives. There's uh, Services for Immigrant Families, which is a CSBG um, funded initiative, which is a citywide initiative to target immigrant families and provide social services. And uh, immigrants are welcome to participate, encouraged to participate in many of the uh, youth employment um, programs as well. Yes, you mentioned broadly that uh, uh, you provide, or DYCD or the program uh, provide uh, services to immigrants, but could you be specific uh, in terms of, you know, Give me a concrete example of services provided to immigrants. Because, you know, the immigrant people, they have specific challenges. They have, you know, special challenges. Being immigrant is already a challenge, you know. You know, when they come over here, this is a different country, different culture, different everything. Sure. So they need to navigate and to succeed in this uh, United States, which is a great country, a land of opportunities that we all know. But they do need advice. They need assistance. They sure. need resources and opportunity. Could you uh, uh, highlight for us or give us the detail about the different services provided to immigrants? Sure, I can. Uh, I can highlight, and then, um, and certainly, we can circle back later on to the the council if you request further detail. But the immigrant, uh, excuse me, the NDA uh, immigrant services programs, as you rightly point out, recognize that you know within our community there may be populations that have tried to stay uh, under the radar. You know, particularly with you know the the federal climate and other concerns, and so there are specific outreach strategies needed to help people obtain social services, to help people obtain greater uh, you know legal standing in the, the country, but also civics and understanding of uh, how things can work and how to participate more fully in in New York City. And so there's programs that offer social services and outreach and case management that target immigrant communities to provide those services, and that's an option of the NDA initiative, so we have those programs throughout the city. Uh, one of the uh, challenges uh, facing immigrant people is languages, for some of them. Those who, who came from countries where English is not the, you know, the official language. Uh, what do you have in place in those program to help the immigrant people who don't speak English and, you know, uh, properly to uh, uh, be uh, uh, sufficient, you know, and to strive and to succeed succeed in New York or in, in New York City. Sure. In terms of, for example, if somebody come over here, speak Spanish or Edu or any other language, but this is a big barrier because the person doesn't speak English, that person won't be able to, to take advantage, you know, uh, from the many wonderful services we have available for people. The first, I think this is the first tool is the ability for the person to speak English. We all know that. What is uh, 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 you are doing, or uh, DYCD, uh, through the NDA program, DYCD is doing to, to help those people to make the transition, the, you know, a smooth transition from their language to the English language? Well, I think there's a couple of things that I could point to. So one, I referenced the, uh, the NDA immigrant services programs, uh, which... Because DYC relies on community-based organizations mm -hmm. and understands they have local knowledge of the population they serve, they speak the languages that the immigrant communities themselves speak, so they're able to, to navigate and, and speak in a way that they can be un understood while they're navigating, helping navigate some of these difficult transitions. But I also mentioned uh, in my testimony the NDA includes adult literacy services, and so DYCD uh, as a convener and as an institution, we encourage all of our providers to cross-refer. 
So if an immigrant presents with some social service needs, but is also looking to develop their literacy in, in English, we want that, that individual or that family be referred to NDA uh, adult literacy programs too, so they could take an advantage and they'll be able to, to speak and increase their, their knowledge uh, written sp spoken of, of English. Those pro pro programs provided to immigrants or to the participant, are they free? Or they, yes, they're, they're free. They're all free? Those programs are free. And how many participants, uh, you know, the program serve every year? Uh, how many, many participants and how many families also, if you can say that? Um, yeah, the, um, my, my testimony was I had focused primarily on opportunity youth, but I can tell you offhand from um, our last annual review, we served about 19, 20,000 individuals, maybe 15, 16,000 families under, yeah, under CSPG. Yeah. So that's cutting, uh, that's cutting broadly, broadly across programs. So how you determine, there are many needs. When you talk about an uh, area where there is a high uh, concentration of poverty, so we got to find a way to identify the need of those people. So how you, what is the method that you use to identify the need, the real need of those people? Sure. How to help them succeed? I think that um, the NDA has a very robust and a very participatory approach to that. So. As I mentioned in my testimony, we have a whole structure of neighborhood advisory boards, as I think the, the chair referenced early in your opening statement. And so we conduct community needs assessments periodically to determine needs. And so we look specifically to stakeholders who reside in those communities so that they have voice and they have say in identifying what their needs are and taking that information collectively to establish what are the highest priorities that need to be attended to. One thing I didn't point to um, in the testimony is the most recent community needs assessment, because we were talking about the existing Opportunity Youth Program. It's based on the last needs assessment, but we've just completed recently a pretty robust community needs assessment, and that document um, was shared with the city council members. We can certainly follow up and recirculate the community needs assessment. Um, and if you review that document, you'll see we're asking, uh, I think to your point, several important questions. What are the greatest presenting needs in the community? I'm sorry. Among them, no, it's fine. Yeah. And asking across a broad, away, a broad, broad array of parameters. Has it been related to housing, or related to education, or related to employment? You know, we, re we really want to stay attuned to what communities say are the most pressing needs they're, f they're facing when we refresh these assessments. So could you tell about the composition of the, the neighborhood advisory board, the composition of that board, and also how the members are selected? I know how the members are selected, but, but for the audience and for the people sure. who so are I've listening or watching. Sure, I referenced um, in my testimony each neighborhood advisory board is composed of uh, members identified by DYCD and members obtained by local elected officials. Mm -hmm. So we look to our stakeholders broadly, certainly the city council members, we also look to state assembly and uh, members of the House of Representatives to refer uh, persons in their community to serve on those boards. And DYCD actively recruits for NAB memberships uh, tabling at community resource events, et cetera, et cetera, looking for members who are themselves at or below 125% of the federal poverty, poverty level and are looking to make a difference in, in a local way through participation. Uh, when we talk about young people, you know, uh, going to school, especially young people in the disadvantaged area, in the poor area, uh, reaching high school is great, is a good, you know, accomplishment for them. And going to college some of the time, you know, represents a big challenge for many of our young people in New York City in the point that many of, the, of them don't have the opportunity to go to college for many reasons. Mm -hmm. What do you have in place to help those young people who are making the transition from high school to college to help them make, you know, a successful transition sure. to our college? The, um, so we talked a bit about the Opportunity Youth Programs. So those are working with young people who may have graduated, but they haven't taken the next step toward college to help reorient them and maybe help change their trajectory, whether it's toward educational or vocational opportunities or possibly college. 
But we also have the NDA high school programs, and those target young people who are currently in school. They may be at risk of dropping out of school, mm -hmm. and the program offers some support, complementary work that doesn't replicate what happens in the school day to try to get them to stay, to get that diploma, and to consider next steps. It could be career, but often it is college, and a number of those programs have very robust college readiness as a component of their program design. I remember that one of the uh, French philosopher Rousseau said that uh, a human being is the product of the environment, you know? And when we talk about uh, the young people, we cannot I ignore the adult, the seniors, you know, where those young people are living. So could you tell us what type of program of assistance or resources you got available for the seniors? For seniors. NDA seniors programs will offer um, generally one of two things, although we have some providers that offer both. Some will focus on, um, was it physical, social, and curriculum? Um, physical, social, and uh, cultural recreation, that sort of thing, to keep our seniors vibrant in their community, target those who might otherwise be shut in to make sure they come and congregate and spend time with their peers. Other programs focus on social services and access to benefits and services. So some of our seniors may feel disconnected, even if they're, you know, adult children may be somewhere in the periphery of their lives. They need another guiding hand to help them navigate these systems. It could be sometimes complicated. And as I pointed out, some of the programs do both of those things. One of the things uh, I would say anecdotally I'm very pleased about to see in the seniors' portfolio is some of them do intergenerational activities. So we're the Department of Youth and Community Development to so have certain seniors programs that do intergenerational work and they're able to transmit some knowledge and wisdom to young people. We're really glad to see that that's one of the things that happens in the program. I also want to mention we have uh, a very great working relationship with our sister agencies and among them Department for the Aging. So for seniors who still want to play a viable role in the workforce, we partner actively with DIFTA to assist them in that, in that work. And some of our seniors programs actually are work sites for other seniors to come. I think that's great modeling when a senior sees other seniors are still very vibrant and active. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that you partner with the Department of Aging. So what are the organization, a community-based organization that you work with in the uh, intent or effort to make sure that the participant they get exactly or they receive the services that they need? Well, we, we contract with about 200 community-based organizations, and so we actively seek to continue to increase that and leverage the impact of our funding by encouraging those providers to have linkage agreements and other relationships. But in terms of other city agencies, there's a wide array of other city agencies that we try to work with, again, as a convener, on behalf of our community-based organizations. So I'll give you one example. The NDA initiative, as I've mentioned, is primarily focused on providing social services and referrals. So some of our other city agencies, like health and hospitals, or like the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, they have core expertise in ensuring that participants get the medical attention or the mental health or the other care that they need. So um, you know, our commissioner has launched us on a very uh, robust campaign of integration. And so we're actively referring our providers and our community organizations to meet with, to case conference with those other providers to say you get kind of a two for one. You're going to get your social services, but you're also going to get your health care needs met. And in turn, when people visit a clinic or a hospital, if they have social service needs, then those entities will refer to our program, so it's a way that we try to maximize our investment. Working together is wonderful, is uh, great, because I do believe that by working together we will achieve much, much more. Sure. But uh, what type of follow-up method or system, you know, a tracking you know, system that you have to ensure that those uh, participants, they, they are served and they receive the program that they, that they need, and also, the collaboration with the other uh, organization is a productive and successful collaboration. Sure, that's How do you track that? How do you measure that? That's, that's a great question, actually. The, um, the, the agency provides a database, and so uh, Ms. Harris and her team, in their oversight of the individual contracts, 
looks into the database to make sure the things that we've contracted to have happen are actually happening. So that includes enrollment data, that includes attendance data, and importantly includes uh, case notes. So these social service programs, if they employ case managers, someone is expected to follow up and see, did the participant or did the family get the services that they were seeking? So we look for validated proof. We do on-site assessments as well as looking in the, the database to see the documentation that verifies people got what they, they came for. Uh, you were talking about the federal funding or grant received by the DYCD. How much is that uh, funding? The um, last uh, annual awards um, in, the, in the neighborhood of 30 million. I don't want to I don't have the number for me. I don't want to make up a number, but in that, in that neighborhood. Million? Yeah. So the bulk of that funding goes toward the NDA initiative. Mm -hmm. um, there's other funding that I referenced in my testimony that goes to the citywide initiatives that are funded by CSBG. So the immigrant uh, service for immigrant families, adolescent literacy programs, some of the literacy uh, English as second language programs, and I feel like I'm forgetting something. But it'll come back to me. Sorry? Oh, and the fatherhood initiative, mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes I talk so much about fatherhood that I give it a break for a second. Yeah, so that's how we allocate the um, CSPG award. So what is the percentage of funding used to serve the funding award? What is the percentage of uh, the 30 million? I can, uh, can we can circle back following the, the <laughs> council, but obviously the overwhelming majority of the funding goes to the contracts that, that DYC makes available to community-based organizations. There's some money, obviously, for the personal services that ensure the, the proper oversight of that money, but the bulk of the funding goes directly to the But do you community. have the number? You say, do you have the number, the numbers, the specific numbers, how much money goes there, how much money goes there? Well, DYC certainly has it, Can yeah. Can you send it to my office? I would appreciate certainly, it. Certainly, yeah. Just to get an idea. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, services uh, that and programs provided to the different uh, neighborhood where there is a high percentage of poor people, are these services, they are all the same, same services in all the 42 neighborhood areas? For, for NDA, for each of the seven program areas, there was a request for proposals. And so there are certain expectations of what's going to be in the program, program design. Mm -hmm. And then the community organizations that vie for the award through their proposal they, um, they illustrated some way that they were going to deliver on what was expected, but embracing whatever the local needs may, ha may have been. You know? So I'm trying to think of a good, uh, a good, well, okay, so we talked about seniors before. So it was available f for the seniors program either to focus on social services or to focus on social, cultural, and recreational activities. And so through a transparent bidding process, each award that was ultimately best scored it really had to include a community-based organization that understood local needs and was able to say for this particular NDA and for the seniors we're going to serve, we're going to bring certain emphasis on this or certain emphasis on that, as long as they're meeting the expectations that we set under the RFP. There are core activities for each program under the RFP, and we may have a list of uh, suggested additional activities from which they may choose. They can add other things as well. They had to have complied with all of that in winning the award. And when Ms. Harris and her staff oversee the contracts, they make sure that those activities are happening uh, as anticipated and with the frequency that was anticipated as well. For the allocation of the funding, I know that you say that uh, you allocate the funding through RFP, request for proposal. Yes. And uh, we know, and I know because I was on the other side also, most of the time there are small organizations, small community-based organizations that are doing very well, so serving the community, helping the community with the leader that they have. But they don't have the, the resources and the, 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 the professionals to write proposals for them. To respond to those proposals, some of the time they are very complicated. So what DYCD has been doing to ensure that they, all those organizations that are serving poor neighborhoods that would like to have some funding also to provide services. What DYCD has been doing to help them, you know, and to make them able to, f to, to fill out those uh, 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 RFP. Sure. And to ensure that the RFP also 
are competitive to those big organizations who are experts. Sure. No, um, no, thank you for that question. So DYCD, like other um, city agencies providing human services, is using uh, HHS Accelerator for the bidding process. You know? And so the aim for HHS Accelerator is very much, as you said in the spirit of your question, is to increase the chances of bidding, to simplify the procurement process, to give uh, organizations at varying levels of, over, of uh, capacity an opportunity to vie. And so uh, this current round of the NDA RFP went through the accelerator process. And so they had, you know, r relative to how it may have been historically, they had a much more simple, uh, very straightforward, and a, a shorter process in terms of submitting their proposals. Uh, b before I move on, uh, you know, uh, ask some more questions, uh, you know, I transfer the, I recognize, I, I should say, my colleagues who are here because they have questions also. Could you tell me uh, what is your, your method to evaluate the program provided by uh, uh, by DYCD to the poor neighborhood? How do you evaluate, you quantify the success of the program that you are providing? Because we know that we may be uh, doing all the effort that we can do to provide great services to address the issues facing the people. But we got to evaluate that also. We got to sit down and take a moment and say, are we doing the right thing? Are we using our resources, our effort, our energy to do the right thing? And what is the result? Do we reach the goal? What is your method sure. of... Uh, There's a number of qualitative and quantitative things that we try to look to. So um, I want to speak briefly about the quantitative stuff and then the qualitative stuff. So as with any other contract that do I see, is there are going to be certain expectations. So for an NDA contract, there's going to be an enrollment target. So you should have a number of slots or enroll a certain number of people in the program. And there's also going to be an outcome target. So there's something that we expect that conditions will change for the individual, individual or family as a result of being in the program. And so we look to see the efficacy of the programs over time and how they're doing with that. And because we try to be strengths-based, just like we put in the contracts, we expect them to be strengths-based in the community. If programs are having some struggles, we work with them to try to help them reach the performance targets that were stated in the, in the contract. And but before I go into other qualitative stuff, I want to mention, even with the quantitative stuff, we suggested outcome rates in this RFP because we wanted to make it clear to the community organizations that were vying for these contracts that we know, the DYC knows that this work is hard. And what we didn't want to have happen was have providers say, I'm going to work with whatever the program area, disconnected families, disconnected individuals, do really hard work, and 95% of the people are going to get such and such and such. So we know that that's unrealistic, and we didn't want to set up a bidding process where people started promising the moon and things that can't really be done. We know that this work is hard. Families are struggling, and they need help. So by suggesting outcome rates, 40 to 60%, we could get something realistic back, and then it would be more fair on DYCD's part to judge and evaluate performance based on what the provider said. So that's some of the quantitative stuff that we do to evaluate. In terms of some of the qualitative things that we do, we, also, we survey the CBOs themselves and the directors to see how good of a job do they believe DYC is doing in its oversight and its support that we're giving them. And we also survey a sample of the participants who were served. How well did the agency do? Did they meet your needs? Did they meet your family's needs? If they referred you, did the referral help you? And so that's another tool that we use to try to, to track how well things are, are going. We also sample the case notes themselves to see what are the different issues people are coming in for uh, and the struggles they're facing and how the agency help intervene to help them out. You know, to, uh, based on your evaluation, what you just said, your method of evaluation or your previous evaluation of the programs, do you believe that DYCD reached the goal to help people become uh, uh, self-sufficient, the poor people become self-sufficient, or do you believe that the program help the participant to succeed? I do, I do. Um, there's, these are big issues, and obviously there's always additional work that we can try to do and other methods to explore, but I think 
the, uh, the results of our evaluations demonstrate that uh, participants are being well served. They receive assistance struggling with difficult issues, and we can point to uh, concrete evidence that they're getting supports that help increase their self-sufficiency. Yeah, you say you do, and I want to believe you, because you, I know that you are honest and sincere in saying that, but if you want to you know, talk about the percentage of success, do you think that DYCD is 50% successful, 40%, or 10%? or 80% successful and assisting those people to succeed? I, um, or 50, I'm, a, 50. I, yeah, I'm unclear. I'm not how talking only about, I, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about one Maria and uh, those wonderful people who had the opportunity to, to uh, take advantage of your program and to succeed because I don't believe that all part the participants are one or Maria. Of course, there are many other one Maria or uh, but I don't think that all of them, you know, succeed. So I'm talking about those who didn't succeed, and what is the reason why you believe that you know they don't succeed? If the major, if if the percentage is very large in comparison to those who succeed, so I believe that something should be done, something should be changed, more effort should be uh, done. So what do you believe that should be done? to ensure that more participants succeed, because this is the goal. I think that's a, I think that's a balance that has to be struck uh, both between uh, DYCD and, you know, you chair and the city council, the local elected officials. We know that working with individuals and families in poverty is difficult work. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we try to do both quantitative and qualitative uh, assessments and evaluation. Sometimes a success story like the ones I presented help signal the path forward when the numbers alone do not. And I think it's important uh, that we can continue to link arms when there may be detractors who if they don't say, oh, 90%, 95%, 99% successful, if you don't lift every person who you touch out of poverty, your program is a failure. So uh, you know, I, I appreciate the question. And uh, I think the, the only response I know to offer right now is again, we know the work is hard. Sometimes you have to look anecdotally and qualitatively to see, as a result of this intervention, did someone increase their skills? It may not, sh for some people, that may not show immediate discernible events, but qualitatively in the world of that participant, it could have made all the difference. And it could show up later on down the road in terms of skills gain, in terms of networks increased toward their later self-sufficiency. So. Um, I, yeah, I think that's, th I, I, I don't know how to answer your question beyond, beyond that, though. Okay, um, thank you for, for your response. Um, you mentioned before that I'm a, I appreciate that the fact that you say that this uh, should be uh, resolved or should be addressed through a collaboration between DYCD, the city council, and other. This is wonderful. Of course, we have to partner. Mm -hmm. We have to partner. We have to create a team where all of us, we try to address the poverty, you know, in New York City. Because this is a serious issue. Sure. Very serious issue. I don't think that DYCD alone can address it. And if DYCD fail, I believe that all of us in New York City we fail. City government, government, and private sectors. But the reason I want to put emphasis on that is we know that there they, they are more poor people now than before, according to the statistic, according to the report. We have more poor people now. So that means something doesn't work well. Something that we didn't do well. Not mm -hmm. DYCD alone. I'm talking about a we. And the goal of this program is to address the issues of poverty and to help people get out of poverty, to help people get the skill, the knowledge, the, the resources that they need to succeed, to strive, and to become self-sufficient. And the more critical point is there are more children, poor children, than adults. This is a serious issue. Because our children, we all know that they are our future. We have to make sure we provide them with the resources that they need to become self-sufficient, to become successful. Otherwise, our city, our country, probably they are going to be in trouble. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. What DYCD 
is doing to address the issue and to make sure we can say probably five, ten years from here, we got less poor people than before. Because the program is to address the issues of the poor people, especially in the poor neighborhood. So if we have more poor people now, something may be wrong. I don't say something, but something may be wrong. Because the goal is to decrease the poverty level. We, I don't think that we reach that level yet. Because we got more poor people. So this is something I don't think. If you want to comment on that, I would appreciate to, to hear your response. I would just reiterate um, and maybe go a little beyond what we were talking about partnerships. And I mentioned working with health and hospitals and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So similarly with Human Resource Administration, Office of Citywide Health Insurance Access, people need to be able to tap into available supports. And so we work collaboratively with them or small business services. We have programs where if you have enough um, potential candidates for a job, they'll go on site to do the interviewing. And so we've had some successes, I can think anecdotally, in our fatherhood program, partnerships with SBS resulted in young people getting jobs because they were, they were able to interview and kind of cut through some of that. And we look to work with other city agencies to make sure the providers that we work with know of and are utilizing other resources the city is making available. And you're right, no one agency, no one effort can do it all alone. Poverty is too big a, a problem, but we are, we're trying. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We have been joined by Councilmember Palma and Councilmember Chin. Now I want to give uh, to Councilmember pa Palma the opportunity to ask some questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Assistant Commissioner, I'm interested in, in knowing in terms of the <laughs> engagement with the employers um, when, when they're doing the internships. Are, are any of the employers um, committing themselves to actually giving permanent jobs to some of the participants or are they just taking advantage of the internships? Yeah, thank you for your question. It's not a requirement of the internship. They're not obligated to place the young person. What we do is, like with other social services programs, we do our relations with the community-based organization. So in receiving the awards, they understand what the ultimate objectives of the programs are. And we defer to them in terms of both recruiting the young people and understanding what their needs are, but also recruiting the work sites and understanding both what their immediate needs are and what the, uh, the objectives of the uh, undur enduring, sorry, enduring objectives of the programs are. So it's not a requirement, but it's where we're all trying to, to go. So we, we leave it to them to, to liaise. And so some of the stuff that we have, some of the things that we've done along the course of running the program is provide capacity building and technical assistance for the providers, both in terms of recruiting additional job sites retaining those job sites, advocating for their young people to understand who's coming to their job sites. And we think it's important you have that period of unsubsidized work so there's a little bit of hand-holding and you know what you're getting. You know? So we can point to some anecdotal su successes about people being retained. Um, but I would also say if young people are getting a taste of the formal world of work, if it leads them to another job somewhere else and they're happy about that job, we're excited for them about that too. And, and I, I appreciate, I mean, you know, any, any work site, any employer um, giving, you know, the, um, young people who are out of school and don't have any work skill the opportunity to gain some of those skills. But I think, as the chairman was alluding to, it's important to make sure that we're, connecti we're connecting them to real jobs with real wages to be, be sure that they can lift themselves out of poverty. And so I think that, you know, we just need to to work a little bit harder to, to um, allow the employers to also understand if you're able to develop uh, uh, one of these participants and that they're a right fit for you, that we are strongly encouraging them um, to give them the opportunity for um, you know, employment and not just have um, employers take advantage of you know, just um, developing someone with skills in, in, in you know, in exchange for for an internship and not having then a plan for long-term employment. Um, I know as speaking for myself, my experience and what I went through as a 
a teen mom and a youth if it wasn't for the community benefits agreement that I was able to attend with a, you know, through Bronx Community College with a guaranteed um, job connection because of the elected, local elected officials at the time, I would not have been able to lift myself out of poverty, right? And so um, that was, uh, you know, Bronx com a, a collaboration with Bronx Community College, the elected officials of a uh, nursing home that was going to be built, and then finding the people in the community to get trained in all levels of, of right, nursing, uh, maintenance, um, whatever it required to run that nursing home, then to place us into those jobs. And so I think um, we, we need to, to do a better job at making sure that, you know, the employers that we're seeking um, are not only those retail jobs, right? Not not the um, targets and and the best buys and those types of jobs, but jobs that re that really offer um, real um, mm -hmm. wages and, and opportunities for people. Thank you. If I may offer two things, my staff uh, has advised me. Uh, statistics show thirty seven percent have extended an offer after the internship. So that's good. That's not a hundred percent, but it's 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 a, it's good as a start. And then. I think to what I mentioned uh, a moment ago about some of the interventions we try to do, capacity building, we try to do are in the interest of going. If we're at 37%, how do we bring that number up? How do we increase the uh, uh, um, retention? Um, and I'm reminded one of the provider meetings, um, this is about three months ago, I think, where we did a workshop with those providers who do the job site recruitment. And one of the scenarios was not the kind of works that we'd want, the kind of works out that you're worried about. So just some kind of Correct. dismissive, mm -hmm. like, well, I just need the free, no. How do you redirect those conversations? So we try to anticipate some of those things may happen across the city, and how do we change the pathway, again, advocating for the young people who do want to work. And and, and then my my last question is in regards to um, follow through with, with those participants that don't, um, that, that do the internship and then exit, um, how are we tracking them to make sure that they're being successful and not just fall off the grid? The, um, we get some feedback from the providers post, um, what's the word I'm looking for, post-placement, you know? And I think there are always ways that we could try to further strengthen that. Um, we're still exploring different vehicles. The participant survey I referenced earlier for the chair is one vehicle to find out if people are happy with the services. Yeah. So I think we can continue to explore ways to, to get even better at doing that. And and that will, in, in terms of follow through, that will continue for someone who may age out, who's 24, but you know, the program services, um, participants 16 to 20, 24, let's say somebody, you know, turns 25, finishes an internship, is that the end of them or are we still going to provide services for them? Well, I think the, lar the larger point is it's, it, well, it's certainly never the end of them because they're in their, their life, but because we have an array of strategies, both the NDA itself and, and the agency, there are other opportunities that are available. You know, like for instance, a healthy families program would serve an individual family, family members of any age. So if they ever needed uh, a helping hand, even on a different matter, then they could they could always come back to services. And what um, I was and another point in the, I was uh, making to the chair before is we really DYC has really been looking to support and to bolster uh, linkages from provider to provider and from program area to, to program area. So that's also in the interest of what what you said. You were touched here and it helped you out. You might need something else later on down the, the road. And the person who did the intervention the first time might be the best conduit to let you know about the, the other thing. The last thing I should say is right on our website, we make it available to know everything that DYC is currently funding. And so we try to push that information out to the providers in part so they can make that information known widely among you know prospective participants and actual participants too. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Assistant Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Palmer. Council Member Chen, please. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a follow-up question about you know tracking. Um, so, DYCD, you have your own um, participant tracking system. Yes, we do. So, um, how have you been implementing that in terms of the question that Council Member Palmer asked? There. Um I guess there's, there's several things we could talk about. So um, there's another member of uh, my team 
and her uh, division that trains on the system itself. So whenever a new contract is awarded, we have the community-based organization staff come in and understand how to use the database. And so it allows us to collect demographic information. I mentioned enrollment data, attendance data, case note information. You can also upload uh, validating documents. And so both through desk audits and then as a primer before staff go out in the field, they can be conversant to know how the program generally is, is doing. Because you know if you only rely on the day that you show up and you go to see a group activity and there's supposed to be 15 people and you see 10, that may raise some questions, but you'd like to see what's the history. Maybe the weather was bad that day, but otherwise the program's been doing a great job. And so um, this, the system that we have been using, and all these systems are in the process of being updated, but the system that we have been using, DUICD maintains, as I said, we train, there's a number of reports that we pull, and we try to make it functional and useful to the providers themselves, so there's information that they can pull for themselves. If you want to see a registration report, how many people uh, came in the program, when they obtained the outcomes, what kind of outcomes they obtained, they can pull that information for themselves as well. So then they're able to track um, post-training uh, or post-employment? Yes, the system will uh, allow them to enter data and to follow up and continue to, to track and work with the participant throughout the fiscal year. And if um, they haven't finished working with that client, they can re-enroll them at the end of the fiscal year into the next year and continue working with that person. But do you, ha so on your system, so you would have the capability to track to see what happened six months later after the participant finished the program or a year later to see if they still remain on the job that they were placed in? I would say six months later. If you say a year after, um, we might not have that ability because once, once the provider does uh, complete their ongoing rapport with the, the participant, there wouldn't be a, there's not another vehicle to put data into the system. It's really uh, both a convenience to the provider and an integrity and an oversight issue for us that they can put information in that we're able to review. Well, I think something you should consider because the, the issue is that how do we make sure that the participants are successful, that they are able to kind of maintain their job and then hopefully continue to move on to uh, building their career and, and continue to be successful? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, after three months, you know, they might lose their job or an employer just kind of keep them um, for a certain amount of time just to meet program requirement. That wouldn't be good. So it'd be really good to be able to track long term mm -hmm. in terms of the success uh, in the program. Sure. So I think that's something um, DYCV should really look at um, into that. My other, my uh, other. Excuse me, uh, yes. Councilmember Chen. This is a very important point raised by Councilmember Chen. Could you tell us what DYCD will do to address this? Because if we don't track the participant, you know, after five, you know, six months, one year, or, but we may have those people get back to the position where they were before, and we won't be able to evaluate if the system is successful or not. Something really should be done. I think right. this is a very important point. We invest a lot of money, a lot of resources, time, energy, to try to address the poverty level. But if we cannot track those people for a reasonable period of time, I don't think we will be able to say that we are successful or not, or we reach the goal. Mm -hmm. What DYCD will do to address that? This is a very important uh, thank issue. You, thank you, uh, um, Council Member and Chair. Uh, I mentioned earlier that all of our systems are being updated, and so uh, one aspect of the, one ups, thank you, one aspect of the update I think that'll be helpful is the uh, the new systems we're moving to will better enable us to track what's happening with participants over a long period of time. So if someone was in, let's say, a uh, literacy program, no, it's not say, let's say someone was in a uh, healthy families program, and then later on they're in a housing program, we can track that with our current system, but the new system we're moving to will allow us to do that, and it will allow us to do more. So if they move from a CSBG funded program to another program that's not funded by CSBG. The new system we're working on will allow us to be able to, to track that. So we'll have better data uh, going forward and all of our programs will move over sometime in the course of next year to see, I think as you're both 
correctly anticipating and asking what are the long-term impacts from all the interventions that we may be doing. So we, we are headed in that direction. The system is being built now for us. Mm -hmm. I heard what you said, but the people in poverty, they are not getting update. Those people in poverty, those people that we're helping, they are not getting an update also. And uh, the, I'm sorry, the data in the system? No, no, those people yep. that we are serving. Yes. So you're talking about, the, yes, we're going to update the system, you're going mm -hmm. to do that. So those people, let's say the, 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 the participants, are they going to be updated about the services also? Oh, okay. Yeah. So the the marketing efforts and raising awareness of the the programs that is an ongoing process. So DYC does that, and the providers that we fund are also doing that too. So if someone continues to need support, we will continue to push out awareness of our programs and make sure that they that they get they get met. Even if they participate in something in the past, if they need something in the in the present, we will continue to market the programs to them. The community organizations also will continue to market the programs to them. Yes, I'm just saying the new s in re response to the last word. The new system will allow us even better than we have now to be able to track uh, movement, let's say, or ongoing participation throughout time. And thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Councilmember Chen. You may continue, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so were you saying that any participant who exit the program, um, if they need additional skills or they they find that you know maybe. Um, there's another program they might be able to benefit from, so they can always come back. Correct. That's, that's good. Um, the other question I have is the coordination. Like, I know that um, this funding, it's not a lot of money, but it's one of the services that you provide are senior services. Yes. So are there coordination between DYCD and DIFTA to see, like, in terms of the, the kind of senior services that are sure. being provided? Uh, by the nonprofit organization. Our team uh, has met uh, periodically with DIFTA. We've actually done a few coordinated site visits, that sort of thing, too. So, uh, you know, we see complementary rather than duplicative services, absolutely. And uh, as I mentioned to the chair earlier, one of the things uh, that I've been particularly excited about is working, our efforts to work with DIFTA around the um, Title V senior um, mm -hmm. employment programs too. So we've received seniors from DIFTA to our sites, and I think that's great modeling for the seniors we serve when they see other seniors who are vibrant, and in turn our providers have referred um, seniors in their programs to the DIFTA Title V, maybe to seek an employment placement elsewhere. So yeah, absolutely, and certainly if there have been any administrative concerns with a site that we share with, with DIFTA, we speak with DIFTA about Coordinating that, making sure the providers are in compliance and all that sort of thing. Yes. Maybe um, the other question, I, my final question, is really the, the really the, the coordination, right? Because this is a, a pool of money. Uh, it's been around a long time. So, in terms of, you're able to um, provide funding to about 200 organizations. So, within the 200 organizations, you have a, a sense of. Uh, are most of them the larger providers, or they are really um, small community-based I'd say that organizations. Uh, I'd say the composition of the providers in the NDA is really a cross-section of community-based organizations in the city. To um, to the chair's earlier question, this NDA of uh, this RFP was bid using HHS Accelerator, and that's in the interest of or partly in the interest of trying to make the, the system, bidding system more transparent, trying to make it easier, trying to make it competitive so that smaller not-for-profits can compete with larger ones. So this was bid through that. And, uh, and we will continue, uh, DYC and certainly NDA will continue to work with Accelerator through the, in the interest of that. But for the smaller organizations, are you, do you provide regular technical assistance to really help them build the capacity? Yes, so we they do. can continue yeah. the good work that they do. That, that's an important part of uh, certainly what my team does, and I would argue any uh, program portfolio at, at DYCD. We try to be strengths based. Once awards are made, we believe the community based organization understood local knowledge and who the participants are, and they are, and they want to serve them. So if there are any performance concerns, we, you know, we don't we don't approach with a stick. We, <laughs> you know, we approach like how can we help. The agency has a capacity building unit, and so we provide technical assistance. We also refer to that uh, unit for uh, follow-up. Yes. 
Absolutely. So um, as an illustration, the prior council member had asked about um, job retention. And I mentioned that we did some customized workshops, just our team with the providers. How do you address those questions if you perceive that work sites might be, that's really what they're in it for and you need to advocate on behalf of your youth? We do, we do things like that all the time with our, with our providers. We introduce other linkages, other um, opportunities for development. Oh yeah, and, uh, and importantly, we recognize the CSVG grant itself may be a small award, but uh, the agencies involved in uh, other kinds of learning opportunities like capacity building, leveraging funding you have to seek other funding. So that continues to be part of you know, ways that the agency embraces and works with the community-based organizations around the city. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Member Chin. We have been joined by Council Member Greenfield and Council Member King. Council Member King, please. You have some questions? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Still morning. So good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, um, Assistant Commissioner Bobbitt. Um, Chair, um, I want to thank you for today's conversation. Excuse my tardiness, but you know we are always three places at one time. Um, so, so forgive me um, for getting here at this time. And if I ask anything that might sound redundant, forgive me again because I still would just like to educate myself and my constituents a little bit of more of what um, NAB actually does all across the city. Um, I know we have our neighborhood community advisory boards as well as that we get an opportunity to select or appoint um, members from the community to sit on it. But I do have a few questions, um, just to understanding your process again. Um, and I will start with uh, neighborhood advisory boards. Um, I just wanted to get an idea of uh, the protocol, if there is any, of the relationship between the board, um, all the boards across the city and elected offices um, after they're appointed. Is there a responsibility on their behalf to report to us um, what, they've been what they've been doing? Um, do they, are they uh, responsible to inviting us to all the meetings that are being held? Um, are they responsible for assigning the meetings within the community and the location, as well as how, what kind of impact do they actually have on the decision-making process of these block grants that come down from the state? I'll stop there, and I do have two more after that. Thank you. If you give me just uh, a moment. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit concerned some of the details you're seeking. I may not have fully prepped for, for okay. today's hearing, okay. but I will, I will still try uh, faithfully to, to answer your question. So I, I had noted in my testimony um, that neighborhood advisory boards are comprised both among referrals received by local elected officials and uh, those identified by DYCD. So uh, the objective there is to have members of the community, certainly low-income members of the community, who want to advocate, try to make a difference in their community, participate. Um, but I can circle back to you, or the agency can circle back to you in terms of uh, a given protocol related to, uh, you know, feedback. And I'm certainly appreciative of both uh, Council Member King and and. Chair Matthew, like I've seen you <laughs> at CAB meetings and sort of things, so I know that you're invested in the in the process, and we certainly make uh, both NAB and CAB members open to the community, not just um, to local elected certainly, but uh, we uh, we actually stream them at this point to which the CAB meetings at, at any rate. We really want to promote the transparency of that front, and uh, and we can circle back to you later on if if I didn't fully address all of that first question. Okay. Um, as far as the organizations that have been selected who get funding, I just wanted to get an idea. Of, um, is there a, or DYCD, do you guys put out a list to all of the 51 members who in our districts are receiving this funding? Because I have no idea um, on a regular basis who have actually won these grants. And, sure. you know, and how do we protect those who are getting those grants mm -hmm. from the big groups or organizations who have capacity, who know how to get grants, who may not, you know, they may take the, we'll just call it a number, they may take the $20,000 that comes with this grant and just throw it into their $2 million budget where someone who has a $75,000 budget can really benefit from mm -hmm. the block grant a little better. So how do you decide that and make sure there is equity 
and fairness sure. in, their, in your process? So um, I guess there's a, a, a couple of things to um, to either state or, or restate to answer that question. So one, Council Member Chen had asked something about the bidding process. So uh, certainly for this RFP and DYCD uh, generally, like other agencies doing social services, we use HHS Accelerator. And so community-based organizations that are vying for funding, they'll upload the relevant documents into that portal. And once they do that, they're made aware of all these funding opportunities that are relevant to them, DYCD, ACS, HRA, et cetera, et cetera. And that's done partly to try to make the process available, transparent, streamlined, et cetera, right? We have, uh, not just with NDA, but for the agency broadly, we have a careful review process to make sure once proposals are received, they are rated, scored, committees meet, that information could be foiled if anyone had a question about the, the process, but we make it fair, we make it transparent. And then to, I think, the last part of your question, once the awards are announced, uh, one, our procurement office makes these awards, um, uh, makes the, the announcement of the awards known and available. But even after that and subsequent to that, we do share that information with the uh, NABs. So you, you may be familiar, but if, if not, let me tell the council, periodically the agency will hold meet and greets. And one of the chief functions why we would do a meet and greet is we want the NAB members in each NAB to meet the NDA awardees who have just received those contracts for the very reason that you state. NAB members put in all this hard work, doing a community needs assessment, holding the town halls, uh, establishing the priorities for funding and even the allocations within the over allocations for that. Many of them volunteer long hours after that, scoring the proposals themselves. And yes, they want to know the result. Not only do they want to know the result, they want to be able to meet that team and be able to look them in the eye and say, you know, you are now the result of this process. And now it goes on to the next phase in the process, which is DYCD as a team that provides oversight to make sure agencies are delivering on what they are committed to do and then we will provide technical assistance as I mentioned in a range of ways to try to support that actually happening. So follow up to what you just stated, I'd like to know how much weight does the Neighborhood Advisory Board have in the decision making of a grant that's being delivered and what is the timeline bes between a, gr a grant being approved to the time an organization receives that funding? I'm going to um, ask that we circle back to you um, relating the, the timetable for, you know, because I, I want to speak for our entire procurement process about the timeline to completion. Um, but related to the, to the first part, uh, we will have three member teams assigned to rate proposals. And those three member teams will regularly include uh, DYC staff, but as you've mentioned and, and I've shared, it can also include NAB members them, themselves, right? So NAB members, when they volunteer their time uh, in conducting a needs assessment, that contributes materially to the ultimate result. When they volunteer their time to participate in reviewing proposals, that too plays a, a helpful role in, in doing the, the result. But NAB members alone just like there's no individual staff member alone that can determine who's going to be awarded a, a, a contract. There's a transparent process for doing that. Teams meet to review their scores and to s discuss what was reviewed, make sure nobody missed anything, and people might need to review things more more carefully along along the way. And, and you know, like there's a whole process that, that goes into that. Okay, um, I'm not. I thank you for that answer. I'm not exactly sure if I got what I was asking for. I'm sorry. Can, um, I, I can I'm just trying to, to understand. Further. Yeah. If, if members from a community, as you say, has put a lot of good hours in to help determine um, what organizations qualify, just wanted to know how much is their decision and their efforts weighed in? Uh, you, know, if, you know, do they have a, a, a real impact on the decisions that are made, or is it just an exercise for the community? I guess that's where I'm going. Oh, okay. You know, so um, that's yeah, no, I, I think the short answer is yes. They have impact and, and what they do matters. And maybe I, maybe I overcomplicated it. So, you know, one, going back a little bit over what I said, I wouldn't devalue or minimize the importance of conducting a community needs assessment. So there's a whole set of activities that helps establish the, the bottom line. So an, an NAB is going to establish uh, has established what the programs are that are going to be funded within the NDA. 
So that is a very important exercise. So if they, as I had shared with the chair earlier, if there's seven program areas that we fund within NDA, each given NAB is determining, are we going to invest wholly and totally in one program for this community, or are we going to fund two or three program areas? Those are important decisions that impact what DYC later will do. So the priority setting is very important. And then once that has happened, when the proposals go out, yes, to the extent that NAB members agree to read proposals, they're not obligated to, not every single NAB member necessarily is reading proposals, but then on top of all those other things, when NAB members are also reading proposals, they're helping participate in the process that given what the NAB said should or shouldn't be funded and how much it should or shouldn't be funded, who seems to have presented the best plan for delivering those services. So I would argue that all those things are important. And as I said, after the awards are announced through the meet and greet, we introduce the NAB members to the NDA awardees that have received funds commensurate with all those things that happen that put them in the position to receive those funds. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up um, with just one, one and a half question. Um, the, the, out of the five boroughs, um, if I missed this answer somewhere along something, um, is, is the funding, how is the funding determined within the five boroughs? Is it like split, you know, each, does each borough get a certain pot that you guys make a decision on? Or is it just based on another formula that you have? Um, you know, because some, some members might say these, you know, we should get X amount of want for these programs that have, might equal 100,000, and then another borough might only get 20,000 out of the whole pot. So I'm, I don't know that, I'm just trying to get your whole budget, and then how is it distributed, is it distributed equal, what the formula might be? We rely on um, City Department of City Planning and Census information related to the incidence of, incidence of poverty around the city to determine those allocations. So that yeah, there's a, that is the methodology, the density and the, and the poverty statistics around the city determine the allocations. And then within that uh, is the process that I, I mentioned. So if a given NAB has X number of dollars to work with, they can set allocations. We're gonna fund one or two or three or four programs within the allocation, given what we think are the, what, excuse, what we learned are the most pressing priorities for our community. Okay, well, I thank you for your, for your answers today. I look forward to the other answers that you're gonna get back to us in regards to what groups are getting the funding and any other communications um, that we talked about today. So thank, thank you. you again for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Councilmember King. Councilmember David Greenfield, please, for some thank, questions. Thank you, Chair, just a couple of quick questions. So the, in the last uh, funding cycle, how much was each NAB allocated? I don't want to. I don't want to pull a number out of the the air right now. Can you know We will get back to you with that schedule. Thank you, Councilman. Okay. And was there a minimum or a maximum grant that the NAB said, could allocate? We said a threshold of fifty thousand dollars. We thought for an award to be functional. That is that a minimum or a maximum? We or said both? that as a as a minimum. Okay. And what is the maximum? Do you know? Is there a maximum or is it in theory possible for all the funding to go to one organization? Um, it's, po it's possible for that. In practice, I would say that the average award uh, has hovered somewhere between seventy and $75,000 for some of our adult services programs and the high school awards are a little bit larger, so maybe a hundred to $150,000. How like often that. are these funding cycles? Uh, at a minimum, every three years. So we have this. So every uh, third year, the funding is, is allocated. Is that correct? DYCD has the ability to extend contracts. So, for instance, the NDA contracts that are currently <coughs> underway, uh, the initial term would close June of 2018, and we could extend those contracts for up to another three years. So they're three year contracts? Yes. Got it. So when is the next cycle? Uh, um, we have recently completed uh, community needs assessment. We are in the process of reviewing that data that will inform uh, the timetable for a future RFP. And we we'll certainly uh, can circle back to the city council when that decision becomes. Uh, final final question. This, this is all very confusing even for us as council members. I can only imagine if you're a small nonprofit director and you're trying to sort of navigate all through this, it's even more confusing. Is there some sort of portal or information or do you have information on your website, you know, if I live in Brooklyn in a specific area and I want to have access and have the ability to apply, do you have that easily defined? Yeah, we, we, uh, we do have it available and um, 
I, I take your point. We do try to make it easy. We try to make it transparent. So I mentioned earlier that uh, at the front of DYC's website, of a portal portal that's searchable for anything um, a prospective participant might be looking for. So they can search, they can actually search by NDA, but you can search by zip code, you can search by borough, type of service you're you're looking for. That's not my question, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood if, if the question. I'm a nonprofit who's yeah. watching this hearing at home and I say, this is interesting, I would like to go and apply for funding from an NAB. Is there an easy way on your website or some other document that makes it simple? It's, it's pretty complicated. Every three years, multiple members, different uh, qualifications, different neighborhoods have different criteria, right? I mean, there's a, a lot of different moving parts. So what do I do as a nonprofit leader who wants to potentially apply for these funds? Sure. Is there uh, an easy portal on your website or is there a piece of paper or is there some sort of instructions, a how-to of sorts to, to go apply? So for example, in my council office, once a year I host an event that says, you want to apply for council funding, here's how to do so. Do you do something similar? Is there some sort of comparable process where you do that for small sure. nonprofits? No, I, I think I better understand the, the, the question. I, I would say to anyone who's watching, uh, my recommendation would be to go to HHS Accelerator's website. The advantage of going to the HHS Accelerator website, the city has that portal. Their uh, information, I believe, is understandable and straightforward. The advantage to applying through HHS Accelerator is not only would that community-based organization then become available to vie for DYCD contracts, they would also become aware of other social service contracts that the city is funding. So whether it's ACS or HRA, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DYCD alike, um, once they have uploaded their uh, Charities Bureau registration and other sorts of documents to that vault, they could become aware of all of it and they would know the, the timetables, the particular applications that are required and uh, you know, they'd be able to stay conversant with all of that. I hear you, I still, and I think it's a good suggestion, but I still would say for very small nonprofits, that's a big, as you know, it's a quite a big task to go through the entire accelerator process. It might make sense for someone in the DYCD to consider creating a, I don't know, one page cheat sheet for folks who are interested in going through the NAB process, because mm -hmm. in my experience, most nonprofits don't even know that these funds exist. They do good work, to be clear, sure. but just in terms of how complicated the process is and how long it takes and how many hoops someone has to jump through, I think it would be helpful if you had a link on your website where you could just say, hey, if you want access to these funds and you're a nonprofit, here's the timeline and here's how it works and here's what you would have to do to apply. Is that something that you folks might consider, perhaps? Uh, if you excuse me one moment, Council Member, I'm just checking so I can answer your question. Okay, great. Um, thank you for the suggestion. We'll certainly look into it. I, I will say that program areas at DYCD, we do try to summarize what the programs are, so that includes the NDA initiative, includes the different uh, citywide funds that we pay for CSBG, but I do take your, your, your point of being we're, useful we're not, to We're not that. disagreeing. I agree mm -hmm. that you're doing a good work overall. I'm just saying that for this particular pot of funding, which is I believe $15.6 million, $15 .6 million per uh, the information that you gave us, I think that for a lot of folks, they just don't even know it exists or how to access it. It's very complicated, especially because the needs assessment, the three-year cycle, the different members of the board, and I think it would be helpful just to have some sort of guide, a how-to guide. Does it make sense for your organization to apply? And if so, here's how it works. Here's where you would check. Here's the zip code. Here are where the meetings are. Here's how you could get involved. I just think that we could do a better job of trying to clarify that for folks. I'd appreciate you taking that into consideration. Yes, thank you for Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Councilmember Greenfield, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, you know, and everything, when we do something, we always have to take some time to uh, identify our challenges, uh, challenges in order for us to move on and to succeed and to reach our goal. And uh, what could you say about uh, the challenges facing uh, DYCD and in, 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 in the, in the effort to address the poverty level? Is it money? And if money is not a challenge, what else you would do, or DYCD would do, to really pull folks in, pull people out of poverty? Because the reason I'm saying that, again, we recognize that we have more poor people now than before, especially children. And I appreciate and I commend DYCD for the wonderful job that you guys are doing. We agree upon that. 
But again, if we have more poor people now than before, that means something else should be done. So I want to know what, are the, what do you believe the challenges are and if money is, part, is not part of the challenges. So what DYCD will do in addition to what they are doing now, what you are doing now, to make sure that we decrease the poverty level and we pull people out of our poverty. Well, I'll, I'll again say that, um, you know, through the NDA, we think we have a viable approach in delivering social services and trying to help people identify resources and practical next steps. That said, as the chair has, has pointed out and you've reiterated, poverty is a huge issue in the city of New York and, and elsewhere. Um, and it, you know, it, go, it goes beyond just what we're doing in terms of the, uh, the services that we deliver. There's conditions that go beyond New York City as well that, that relate to that. Um, it's hard for me to, to put my finger on one specific uh, issue, but I can say anecdotally, uh, you, know, you know, employment, housing, you know, other things that you might in, uh, you know, anticipate, mental well-being, these are all factors, these are all challenges uh, that the clients served by our community-based organizations are experiencing. And so along with providing the, um, the services that we deliver, I mentioned we really try to leverage as much as we can the impact of, of those services by having them be aware of and, and working with other city agency and investments as well. Um, we know that uh, the participants raise many concerns and also the providers also through the survey. So according to the participant, many of the participants, they didn't know about the existence of those programs and certain programs were not provided in the areas. Mm -hmm. Our DYCD is uh, planning to address the, the, you know, the, this uh, very important issue. Sure, so there's different marketing materials that we've been creating and expanding. I uh, want to acknowledge the City Council for the leadership you've shown in terms of uh, translation of materials. So you know, materials will not be made available only in English, they'll be made available in the languages that you know, people speak in the, in the communities. And over the past, certainly over the past uh, couple of years, our, our commission, our, our intention, uh, focus on integration. We've been having uh, meetings and other kinds of convenings uh, to advance a framework for strategic partnership. So if any given provider or portfolio is really good at one thing, maybe they're really good at opportunity youth, or someone else is really good at working with runaway and homeless youth to increase their connection and awareness of one, what one another are doing in the neighborhood. It's something that we've been spending energy and time on because we want to make sure that no one's left behind or no one who would benefit from the next service is not yet made, a, 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 made aware of the availability of that service. So that's what we've been working on. So we know also through the survey, the employers express the uh, preference to receive uh, participants with skill, with knowledge, with certain skill and certain knowledge. And uh, our DYCD is uh, planning to address uh, this concern. Well, um, in the Opportunity Youth portfolio, the job skills development curriculum is an important part of the program. So uh, we will continue to look there with these participants who may not have been job ready to try to advance their prospects both of employment and also of connecting with other uh, maybe advanced uh, programs in our, uh, like the pathway series of different programs that are made available. I know the chair and other council members are aware of an array of youth employment programs that DYCD funds that similarly work on job skills and job readiness as well as you know, preparing and introducing practical opportunities uh, to work. And uh, I know that you say that uh, you are trying to envision how to implement the system, how to uh, respond to the, to the uh, uh, needs addressed through the survey, you know, by the service providers and also by the uh, uh, participant. But uh, my question is, that what is the method you're going to use to reach out those participants, the different people in the community? to let them know exactly, hey, we have those programs, they are wonderful programs, those programs, they are designed for you to help you succeed. What, are, what, what you will do differently 
to reach out to the participant to ensure that they are enrolled mm -hmm. and they take advantage from those wonderful programs that you are offering? Well, I think that the agency is looking to do more. So not necessarily do differently, but do m more of some things that seem to have an impact and continue to do those. So when there are public meetings, convenings, uh, larger community events, DYC has its own capacity to go out and table with our resources, that's Youth Connect. So we make available uh, the array of things that we're doing. And along with having that material, those materials on site, we also have the, the tip cards and we also have the, um, the phone number too. So we really want people, and even if people just call 311 and they're looking for information about stuff, 311 calls for youth are gonna make their way back to DYCD, and so we have an opportunity to let people know different things that we're funding. I think it's really important, and I think, again, what we want to see more of, and we encourage the providers to do more, is it, to market their individual programs. So we try to do our part, as you point out, Chair, about letting people know broadly what the programs are, but in any particular community, we're encouraging the providers to get their marketing materials out, too. This is how you enroll. If there's a deadline, here's the deadline for this particular program as well. Um, and, and they'll share their resources with us, too, so we can have best practices emerge. So there's another program trying to figure out how to position and market their program. They can look at some of what their peers are doing as well in another neighborhood. So we try to promote all of that. Uh, as you know, that uh, according to the statistic and the city uh, information, we have more children who are poor than adults. Is there any study, any survey, any research to try to identify the causes, the reason why, why we have more children poor in New York City than adults? Is there any effort to try to understand the reason why we have more children who are poor than adults? There, there isn't a particular study uh, that points to that issue that, uh, that offhand I would be able to reference, but it's something that we can circle back to you about some of the research that's out there. But I would strongly advise to conduct a study or some sort of research to find out what exactly, what are the issues, what are exactly the causes, because if we don't know the causes, we won't be able to treat the disease mm -hmm. or we won't be able to correct the situation. We will invest, inject a lot of money, a lot of resources, but I believe that it's going to be very difficult to address the issues if we don't know the causes. It's like in medicine. If you don't know the, the source of the coughing or the fever, uh, you won't be able to treat you know, that person. And I will strongly recommend DYCD to put you know, in the, in the, 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 the agenda or the, the services that they are, they are providing you know, something to make sure that we understand exactly the reason why we have more children who are poor than adults. But in addition to that, w w I think that you are disconnected youth or children also who are poor. There may be, and we, this is very simple to understand that, there may be some issues in the families because Many of those, those young people who are disconnected, who are in shelter, who don't go to school, who drop out of school, most of the time, there are some issues in the families, broken families, single families, families are facing many challenges, including being immigrants. So what DYCD has in place to try to assist or to work together with the parents of those young people or also the children to ensure that Sorry. to ensure that the poor children or youth that are enrolled in the program they can receive adequate or really the, 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 the resources and the assistance that they need to get out of the poverty. So um, one thing that springs to mind is for the opportunity youth programs and we have this for our Healthy Families programs as well. When the community organization receives the award, they have to have seven distinct linkages. And the idea that DY City had in mind there is whatever the strengths that the community organization may have themselves, there will probably be other presenting needs that may not appeal to their strengths. So when you consider childcare, 
and elder care and mental health services, possibly legal services, other things. We want them to have sh strong relationships with other providers so they can help families get what they what they need. I just wanted to check some some data. So for FY18, 27% uh, of the opportunity youth are single mothers and 3% are single fathers. So that's just what we are seeing show up right now. And it, it appears to me we correctly anticipated that when young people come in for one thing, it doesn't mean that they don't need a lot of other things, you know, and so having a childcare or, or housing referral or other things in, in place, once that young per or even an older person too, once someone comes in and can have a capacity to get other needs met, you sort of need a lattice of support made available. So these programs are designed that there should be an array of, of linkages to help stabilize and support the participants. Uh, you, you uh, I know that you know that. You know, the issue of poverty, especially for the young people and for the youth, uh, are related or connected to many other issues. Let's say, for example, I would like to know how do you address the issue of anger, violence, and crime, depression, mental uh, uh, disease or situation? Right. What do you have in place to address those issues? Uh, my, my colleagues reminded me, make sure we talk to you about the Healthy Families programs. So the Healthy Families programs have a broad enough lens. Individuals or families who meet the CSVG income guidelines could be coming in looking to access any wide array of uh, services or, or benefits. So uh, whether there's an anger issue or a domestic violence issue or a mental health or a physical health issue, because they have a strength base and a case management model, if they have services available that are on site relative, relative to that family, they can enroll them in that. But even if they don't, they can refer them to the things that they need. And related to the stuff we were talking about tracking, it's also their job to follow up to make sure the family has received the services they came in for or the services they need once it was determined what the needs were. Thank you very much. Let me call Councilman Bachin for some questions. Oh, Councilman Bachin, thank you very much. Um, I, I just had a follow-up. I was listening, um, and I want you to educate me if I'm wrong. At please inc help me understand. Um, I'm hearing you say about the service that um, DYCD provides, and I'm trying to understand as a former caseworker, still doing casework today. Um, is DYCD actually the service provider, or are they the agency that provide products to the neighborhood for agencies like Youth Connect to give the service? Because I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little confused by when you say service and the jobs and the jobs that you provide. So is DYZ providing jobs or is there an agency or is there another organization who provides the service who are doing the hiring for jobs for youth or any other families? Because mm -hmm. I think that's a miscommunication if someone thinks they can come to DYCD mm -hmm. and get a youth job when DYCD is not offering, but they are the conduit for funding for these groups who are doing the service work. Yeah, no, I apologize. Um, for whatever I uh, would have said in my testimony to, to bring confusion to that point. So DYCD makes funding available to community-based organizations. The community-based organizations provide direct services. So they're providing social services for whatever the period of the intervention may be. And then specifically related to the Opportunity Youth Program, there's a period of part-time employment. DYCD pays the wages to the youth for that period of of time. So the CBO is not involved in paying the young person under this program. We pay those wages, short-term wages. But those youth are not coming to DYCD to receive their wages. They're coming to the provider. The provider will place them with a work site, and then we're paying the cost of the, the wages while they're in that job exploration, job development program, and getting the wraparound case management during that time period. All right, so then that goes to my next question, then my last question. So if that is the case, how does DYCD hold their service providers or the people delivering on the product accountable for what they're supposed to deliver because if I give you a block grant of $50,000, how do I make sure you deliver on what you say you're going to deliver? So three years from now, do we continue to give you another grant or does the Neighborhood Advisory Board come back to you in the middle of the, of the, 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 the grant session and say these people aren't delivering and then what, do you, does, what does DYCD do with that service provider who got the money who's not delivering and then at the end of the day, the poverty that is supposed to be addressed is still growing rampant. Sure. Uh, throughout the course of the year, uh, Ms. Harris and her team send uh, staff out to the site to observe programs in action. 
So we'll do programmatic site visits to make sure uh, the days of uh, the hours and days when things are supposed to be happening, they're really happening. There's also administrative review that's done, uh, both on site and then I had mentioned to Council Member Chin about the tracking in the database that we have. So we check periodically in our systems to make sure attendance records that should be there are there. Demographic information about who's supposed to be served is indeed there. Case notes about what clients need and whether those needs are getting met, what follow-up looks like, did clients come back, if clients disappeared for a while, did somebody call and follow up and invite them to come back to the, the program? So we, we routinely uh, review all, all of that. Oh, okay, let me see if I, m I miss anything. So all the community-based organizations within the program and their work sites receive the oversight that I mentioned. So this includes uh, the site visits, there's periodic telephone calls our staff make to the, to the CBO's emails, and there are an um, array of technical assistance that we'll provide as well. So before, before our staff leave the site, whatever their observations are, they may share with the, the site and then we do a, a, written, uh, a written evaluation of the site later on. So if there's feedback, both noting strengths, because we want to see strengths and we want to salute the strengths, but if we see areas uh, that may cause some initial concern, can you clarify uh, the staffing plan didn't conform with what you had followed before, we need to button those things down. And then their enrollment and outcome targets. And so over the course of the year, and certainly on a quarterly basis, we check in with providers and say, if you were projected to serve 100 persons, and it's been six months, and you've served fewer than 50 of those, we're going to check in with the provider and see what's going on. This program in particular is a cohort model. So there are two cohorts a year. So you enroll some in the fall, you enroll some in the spring. If we made it to the winter and you didn't roll somewhere between 45, 50, 55 percent of your participants, we're going to talk to you over the winter about how might you beef up your spring recruitment. You got a few extra slots you want to make sure you are fully utilized. So and let me just stop that right there. I got the you. Let me just, excuse me, yep. you me stop. So that goes back to the question I asked in the first round about funding. Do, do, is this a reimbursement system or, or are they paid? How are they compensated? Because I'm trying to figure out, does funding stop if someone is not delivering halfway through the contract? Or oh, if they haven't got paid before, then they're, you know, how does that play out? There, there's a reimbursement system. So when the contract is awarded, there may be an advancement of uh, two-twelfths of the annual budget. So the program has um, some funding to be able to start operations. And the close of each month, the community-based organization will submit receipts for the expenses that occurred so far. And so it goes throughout the course of the Okay, and my final question is, um, is there a way um, that your agency can work with the council members to give them, or how we, may, we might be able to be a part of the process or understand the process as it's going along due to the fact that many people come to our offices where they're explaining the poverty levels are, and we know what's happening in our districts. So we can identify some of the groups who might be on a list who have applied and say, we need them. We say, no, that, that group doesn't need the money. This money's good. They're, they're good, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to someone else who's really in need of, you know. So, so I just wanted to know how we can play a part if in helping determine or just being able to chime in since we really have our pulse to our neighborhoods, we might be able to offer some assistance. So I just wanted to know, is there a way CY, uh, DYCD can, you know, include us a little bit more in the process so... If we can be some assistance, at least we can be have the option to be there for you. I would imagine that with the transition that both DYCD and other agencies delivering human services have done, where they're using and procurements are going through HHS Accelerator, that it would be uh, welcome whatever efforts the city council uh, would do with community-based organizations, whatever their level of capacity. If you know that the the right persons for the job getting them into that system and encouraging them to apply. And one of the council members had mentioned, uh, had suggested maybe it's a little bit onerous getting started. So I, I don't know precisely whether it's onerous or it's not onerous, but I know the effort has been to try to make the process more fair and transparent. So uh, the agencies that you would advocate really need to be in the, the mix by getting registered, having their documents in the vault for Accelerator, they would become aware of all the funding opportunities and should be encouraged to apply for all those funding opportunities. It, the, the only way to, to have a shot or vie for consideration is if they have indeed applied. Once they have applied, certainly related to the programs that we oversee, we take the position that they understood what the needs were in the community 
and they were fairly awarded the proposal, we want it to work out. And we're going to continue to provide technical assistance and try to work supportively with them while they demonstrate either wonderful performance or maybe some areas where they could improve, but you know, they're trying to do the right thing because we all have the same shared interest, low-income individuals and families getting the services that they've uh, requested and that they need. Well, thank you for your answers. If anything that my office, all of us in the council can do to be of some help, please don't hesitate to ring our bell. Thank you. Thank you. And the polls also. Thank you very much, Councilmember McCain. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, do you believe that the need assessment uh, accurately uh, capture the need and also the concern of the communities? And if not, if not, what else can be done, you know, to make sure that we capture, we really capture the, the need and also the, the, the uh, concern that you, exists in our communities? Thank you. You had asked, um, or you have asked um, throughout the hearing at times about what DYC could be doing differently or, or better. And so I appreciate this question because it, it, it allows us to, to mention uh, the current programs were informed by the 2013 needs assessment. But meanwhile, and I said we just completed this, we just circulated this to the City Council recently, we, our 2017 community needs assessment. So we really want to review and, and understand and have dialogue with the City Council. What do we think the new needs assessment is saying? Because that is going to inform uh, future decisions. But, you know, so to answer your point, I think that we have asked some of the same questions and ask more questions because we've tried to get smarter about the questions that need to be asked. And so this, this newest needs assessment asks questions the agency hadn't, for whatever reason, asked before. So we ask about what are the greatest presenting needs, but we also ask what are the needs that are being met and the needs that are not being met. So we have not yet completed this analysis. We just shared this and just shared it with you. But we are looking forward to completing that analysis because I think um, implicit in some of your questions is understanding existing resources and understanding unmet need where resources haven't been applied. And so we're looking forward to completing that review to see of people said they need what they need, what do they most need, what do they most need that's not getting it addressed so that we can play some facilitative role in prioritizing some of those things. So I, 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 in summation, I do think that it's accurate because it does the data as we're beginning to look at it, it seems fairly comprehensive. And I think we take people at their, at their word. The NABs have done a great job soliciting this kind of feedback. So we have you know, thousands of data points from people who have responded. Um, also, uh, in anything that we are doing, we got to take a moment to uh, identify or analyze our strength and weaknesses because this is the only way we're going to move on. What can you tell us about the, the, the weaknesses and the strength of the program? I think one of the strengths of, of NDA, whether it's the Opportunity Youth or any of the other program areas, is, uh, well, I guess it's, it's twin strengths. The community-based organizations understand what the local needs are. So that and having um, programs that focus on a particular neighborhood. So understand if they're particular cultural or age demographics or you know, presenting needs, supporting um, community organizations that know how to meet those needs. I think that those are twin strengths of, of what we're doing right now. Um, if there's a weakness, I think um, I've suggested earlier, which we're already trying to address it, but relative to other things, we will continue in NDA and, and elsewhere to um, bring attention to the need for integration and, and to move these pathways so that if, if one provider delivers a particular type of service, they know everything else that's available in their community. I don't think we are bad in that regard, but certainly relative to other things, I think that that's something where we need to shore up and we need to continue to, to strengthen. I think the new system we mentioned will help us with our own tracking, and we'll be able to point back to community organizations about here are other referrals you can you can make. So I think that it can become a strength over time. We just have to help our providers uh, get there. Okay, so uh, you know, it doesn't matter how good we are, how excellent, how powerful we are. 
And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much resources that we have and the effort that we are doing to address issues. But there are always challenges. We don't create challenges. Challenges always exist, regardless of what we are doing. But what I want to know, what do you believe the, the biggest or the most important challenge is in terms of, you know, for DYCD to provide the resources or to address the poverty level in our communities? What the biggest challenge is for you guys? I, think I, I, I won't believe that there is no challenges. There are challenges. <laughs> And I know that you are doing a wonderful effort. I agree, on, I, and I commend you for that. But there are challenges. What you know? What is the biggest challenge that you believe that exists? I think the biggest challenge is periodically there are existential threats to the funding, and there's no there's no real challenge at, at the moment right now. Uh, you know, we saw the federal administration their first effort the skinny budget, they looked at eliminating this as a funding source that was rejected by the Congress. So there isn't a real acute threat right now. But certainly relative to other challenges, that's a, a threat that periodically comes up or that's a concern that comes up. And when we meet with community organizations that we fund through CSBG, periodically they may know, well, what's happening with the funding? And, uh, you know, I've only been with the UIC seven years, but for seven years that conversation keeps mm -hmm. coming up, you know. And so, uh, again, nothing has happened. We certainly hope nothing will. We have a, a resolution through December 8th. I know the city will monitor uh, to ensure we have continued funding. Um, so the best I can offer is the way that we try to, uh, to, to coach around that is it appears poverty is a bipartisan issue. So whether a particular federal administration has a full appreciation of what we do in New York City with CSBG funding. There seem to be enough um, level-headed folks on you know both both sides of the aisle who recognize that that issue and continue to support you know those of us in New York City and other places who are trying to fight that real struggle by delivering these these services. Uh, you mentioned you know the card, the budget card from the federal government. We are all concerned about that because there are so many cards there. Uh, planning to do that will affect critical services that the city is providing to people in needs. But uh, in addition to the budget, you know, as a you know, budget, uh, uh, the availability, availability of the budget that could represent a big challenge, but I think there probably other challenges as well important. But anyway, uh, I want to commend you and thank you for your testimony and for your presence over here. I want to commend GYCD and all the wonderful staff for the job that they went on behalf of the, our youth and also our citizens, our constituents. But uh, uh, to conclude, I believe that uh, we have to do more. I'm not talking about GYCD alone. As a city, as a society, we have to do more because I want to get back again to the statistic and to the information that we can find in the city record. We have more poor people today than before. And especially we have more children who are poor than we had before. That means something has to be done. And again, I commend DYCD and all the service providers for the wonderful job, for the effort that they are doing to address the poverty level. But I think we are not there yet. And I hope for the next hearing, probably next year, whoever is going to be the chairman of the Youth Services Committee or the council member, members will be part of the uh, Youth Services Committee, they will hear another word, another song. We will be able to say, oh, wow, we have less people poor now than before. I think this is the goal. The goal is, try, is, uh, to, tr is to address the poverty le level and to make sure that all people can become self-sufficient and successful in our great city of New York, to provide them with the resources and the opportunities that they need to get out of poverty. But if we have more, I don't think that we reach the goal. And again, I don't want to blame DYCD. I don't want to blame you. 
because that is uh, that it will take all of us to reach that goal. And this is my hope that one day we work together and do the right thing to reach that goal. And we will be able to say, we have made it together. We have less poor people than before. Thank you very much to both of you, and thank you. Now we are going to call the next panel, Monica de la, de la Cruz from Phyllis Neighborhoods, Jessica Welk from CHDFS Inc. Miss Monique, I want to apologize. I think that it is Monique de la Haz, right? Thank you. Okay. All right. You can start any time, but please don't state your name for the record. Good morning. Hello. All right. Good afternoon. Good, good, uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Monique de Laos. I am the Senior Director of Learning and Career Development with Phipps Neighborhoods. So thank you, Chairman Eugene and the Council for having us. Um, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the South Bronx is the poorest congressional district in the United States of America. Our organization helps children, youth, and families in the South Bronx communities rise above poverty through education and career programs and access to community resources. Um, these are the most impoverished communities that face high crime rates, staggering poverty rates, low graduation rates, lack of access to essential resources. Phipps Neighborhood's mission is to combat poverty, and we do so each day by supporting each community member and their respective households overall. We provide an array of quality workforce development programs and education programs, of which we have two NDA Opportunity Youth programs. This testimony includes our priority recommendations to further enhance and strengthen the Opportunity Youth program design, which are as follows. The budget size. One of our NDA Opportunity Youth contracts total budget is only $26,400. The price per participant is $1,056 to serve 25 young people annually. We are to provide youth with paid work experience, work readiness training, and education and career counseling. These funds do not allow for robust program design, appropriate staffing structures, and comprehensive alumni services. Traditional funding for Opportunity Youth has not provided for the skill level of staffing needed for a more comprehensive model. The next section, target population. Currently, this program is for young people that are out of work and out of school at the point of enrollment. This program should be available to those that are enrolled in alternative HSE, aka GED programs. It's very unlikely that a program participant will obtain their HSE credential in 14 weeks. In fact, it can take them a year and a half to two years depending on the proficiency level at the point of intake. At this rate, we have participants that graduate from our program without a credential, they're still unemployed and in need of ongoing services. The next section, program hours. Currently right now, the participants have to do 20 hours of unpaid training prior to the program, which falls significantly short of best practices in career readiness programs as well as youth development. DYCD to replicate some of their practices, um, at, for example, their work, learn, and grow program where it's serving in-school youth, where those students are paid for their 20 hours of orientation. For internship hours, these participants have to work 10 hours of paid. Um, hours during the week. DYCD should use the best practice for summer youth employment program where they can work a maximum of 25 hours per week. Given the population that we're serving, we recommend increasing hours or extending the program duration to ben benefit not only the program participant but respective employers. And then in reference to educational hours, our participants have to do five hours of unpaid um, education time. We are suggesting that those young people be paid for instructional time. 
for interagency integration, we recommend that DYCD partner with HRA as many of their recipients are not able to enroll of our program because of the limited hours for programming, which is a total of 15. If the program model was adjusted, it would serve as a great benefit to the program overall in, ad in addition to leveraging city resources. So for example, HRA can provide childcare and transportation, and right now those students cannot enroll in our program because we do not have enough program hours. The ideas presented in this testimony provide recommendations that we believe will serve as a value add to the long-term outcomes of the constituents that we continue to serve. To share a very quick story in closing, Tara came to Phipps Neighborhood Opportunity Youth um, District 6 program as a single mother who resides in a mother, child, and maternity group home with her infant son. Phipps Neighborhoods networks with other social service agencies and nonprofits to recruit participants in need of our services, and the provider at the group home was one of our referral partners. Tara currently receives a $20 allowance through the, through the group home, and in addition to that, we only pay her about $115. That's not excluding taxes for a grand total of $120 per week for her to support herself and her child. She was placed as a front desk intern at one of our Justice Sonia Mayor Sotomayor Community Center, and over the course of her internship, she has developed customer service skills as well as clerical skills. She'll be graduating on December 13th, and we are going to continue to provide her with services to ass uh, assist her in achieving her personal education and employment goals. She is one of the reasons why we continue to lift our communities out of poverty, and Phipps Neighborhoods applauds the city and the Department of Youth and Community Development for their leadership in improving the Opportunity Youth Program over the last three years. We definitely consider you to um, review our proposed recommendation, and we look forward to working side by side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next uh, speaker, please. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Jessica Work. I work for CHDFS. I'm the admin assistant to our CEO. I directed the summer program for CHDFS where we actually had summer youth employees join us, and I'm a B2H supervisor. Uh, CHDFS Inc., the Center for Human Development and Family Services, is 501c3 nonprofit community based organization. Established in 2002, CHDFS has demonstrated outstanding levels of care in helping New York's families and communities struggling to survive in some of the poorest and most underrepresented communities. We are committed to providing a safe haven and caring community for those in need by assisting families, individuals, and children in meeting their emotional, physical, and intellectual needs. We believe in creating nurturing, non-biased environments in which individuals and families can learn and develop their fullest potential. We accomplish this goal by working with families and children through direct care interventions, advocacy, socialization, community integration, individualized treatment, research, and education. DYCD's Summer Youth Employment Program had a positive effect in 2017 on CHDFS, Inc. This was shown through our own summer program the children that we provide the summer program for, and the SYEP participants, as well as our community. DYCD's SYEP had a positive outcome for CHDFS, Inc. CHDFS takes pride in working with the, the individuals of our community. We take pride in speaking out for our children and families to help them reach their highest potential. Being able to co connect to youth within the community helps us connect to our future as an organization. DYCD's SYEP had a positive effect on our own summer program as well as the individuals that we serve. Having the SYEP involved with our recreational summer program helped our employees and achieve more out in the community when working with the individuals that we serve. The children of our recreational summer program developed a bond with the SYEP youths in which the youth took pride in and turned into exceptional role models to our children by the ending of the summer program. Out of the 13 SYEP attendees, 12 participated throughout the summer of 2017. Eight are finishing up their education and have resumes on file with CHDFS. Two were eligible once completing the SYEP program and went through our interview process. And all had stated having a better idea of what they wanted to do within their futures. DYCD's SYEP is continuing to have a positive effect on the community. This is so by helping the youth find their own passions and creating their own goals through educational work experiences. We watched our summer youth employees become motivated to be a positive part of our community, as well as grew within the time that they had spent with us. When it comes to the DYCD Summer Youth Employment Program, you find a connection. 
a connection to our youth of the SYEP to companies and agencies like ours, a business that wants to help the youth of our world find their passions, create goals, and achieve dreams. Dreams that they have developed through experiences like the Summer Youth Employment Program. On behalf of CHDFS and the children of the CHDFS Summer Program, I would like to thank DYCD for the opportunity to participate with the youth of community during the summer of 2017. To be able to grow our care management agency by finding new ways to connect to the community. To help the summer youth find the good within themselves and to find the passion to strive in reaching new heights and bettering our community by getting an opportunity to learn from summer youth employment sites like ours. Working together on a, our mutual connection, pride. We take pride in our community and continue to help our participants find role models within the summer youth employees. We watched the youth of, youth of the SYEP grow within the summer of 2017. Businesses like ours want to continue this positive trend in the community. CHDFS Inc. and the children, as well as their families of the CHDFS Summer Program, request the continuation of years to come. We look forward to SYEP 2018. Let's continue to connect and grow as a community together. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you to both of you for your testimonies. And Emisa de la Hose, you mentioned that, uh, how much is your, uh, your overall budget, 26,000? For the Opportunity Youth Program. For the Opportunity Youth Program, 26,400. 26,400. Mm -hmm. What is it? This is budget for this program, right? Yeah, for Opportunity Youth, for, for opportunity one of our youth. contracts. Okay. So how many, how many youth or children you are serving? 25. So 25. 25. You mentioned also that certain young people who graduate from your program, they're still looking you know, for mm -hmm. jobs. They don't have placement. What uh, do you do to help them and what DYCD uh, is doing to help you? Yeah, get no, there? no problem. I think the issue that I'm just trying to make there is that our young people come to the program without an education, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of them think that they can get jobs and many employers, that's like the basic you need like a high school diploma or a GED. Mm -hmm. So it kind of keeps them in that, in that cycle of poverty in essence because then they're coming to us for a job and then they think they can get their GED in a couple of months, mm -hmm. but truth be told, it can take them years to you know, get their GED. So in this case, um, they provide us with referrals so they could do another internship program um, or we can assist them with the GED. And we're lucky enough that we have GED programs within our sites mm -hmm. so that we can make referrals internally but in essence, for that participant, they can't get a job per se because they don't have that credential. So they end up going into another internship program where they're receiving a stipend or unsubsidized internships. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know, poverty in the different communities, we are talking about the poverty level. And, you know, uh, we say that uh, there are more young people poor than adults. I know that the, the causes, the reason may be so many multiple, based on your experience working in the community, what do you think the causes of the poverty among children or young people are? Yeah, I think if, um, just right off the back, I think that, um, and you hit them on the nail earlier, I think gang violence and community mm -hmm. violence is huge. Um, FIPS believes in what we call a two-generation approach, so not only are we working with the client, but we're also serving the community and their household at large. So there's also, I think, mental health um, so one of the reasons why I also mentioned here, I think that in essence, DYCD should get more money so that the CBOs can then hire the qualified staff members. Because I'll tell you right now, I have students that have mental health uh, needs as it stands now, but I'm able to leverage other resources within our agency um, so that we can hire the skillful staff person that they need. But mental health, I would say child care, housing, um, and community violence overall are some of the reasons why many of our young people struggle. And even in the example that I gave, this is someone that's living in a group home right now. And she's a teen parent, and she's coming to our program, and she wants to be a criminal psychologist. You know, so we're gonna help her get on that path. But I think part of the issue there is that many a times young people think that they can get something like their education immediately, and it, it's long-term. That's like a long-term goal. So I think it's the reality check that they need to have for us to support them in that capacity. But once she graduates, we'll refer her to another internship program. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, Ms. Welk, uh, you mentioned that uh, you are serving, your organization is serving the children and their families. Yes. Can you give us more detail, more Definitely. information about the services 
that uh, you are providing to the children and your parents also, because this is very important. Definitely. I think for us to address the issues affecting the young people, we have to work together with the families also. This is a very wonderful approach. Could you tell us more about Definitely that, please? I, definitely I can. So uh, we have lots of different programs uh, to start with the youngest of them all, uh, the children, early intervention, working with children under the age of three. We have a program where we uh, incorporate the community, advocate for them in the community, help the family socialize in within the community to find the proper places for them and the proper programs within the New York City and New York State as well. We also have another program called Health Homes where we incorporate uh, individuals who could be um, in this, in this in-between, between hospitalization and uh, as well as that being homeless and, and being in those kind of situations where we work with them and we help them build and we help them grow uh, with different advocacy programs and different socialization, working with them at, in the community with care managers as well. Then we also have a program called B2H that's working with the children who are in the system. The children can either be in group homes, could either be with a foster family, or could either be uh, with adopted and uh, trying to help them stay uh, stable. Uh, a lot of the children we find they're being hospitalized or they're running away and they end up on the streets and they end up in a group home and it's a whole process for them to get back into a foster care or even getting adopted. So we work with those children um, who need that support. When it comes to families, we provide services like family caregiver support or crisis avoidance management training. Uh, programs within our, our programs have different services within them that help the family reunite with the children to help that family grow and stay together long term. And thank you very much. And how many young people or children your organization is serving? Definitely. Uh, I can't quite give you the full number at the but moment, but I can definitely give you approximate. Uh, we work with, I would say, I would say somewhere around 200 uh, families within New York State, New York City. Mm -hmm. We also work with families um, upstate in Rockland County and Sullivan County. We work with children in Staten Island as well. So the 13 uh, participants you're talking about is only for SYEP, right? No, I'm talking about the different programs that we have as an agency. Uh, no, uh, you mentioned like 13 participants. Yes, exactly. Is it for SYEP? Yes, okay. exactly. We had 13 summer youth employees uh, join us during the summertime. A lot of them was, weren't sure what exactly they wanted to do, um, and most of them actually found something in our agency that connected to them and helped them grow within the six weeks that they were with us. I'm going to ask you the same question. I know this is a very difficult question to answer because this is a very complex situation. Mm -hmm. The poverty among our young people. What can you tell us about you know, the causes based on what you have been seeing in the community? What you believe that you know, create or, you know, the, uh, the, uh, such a large number of young people or children poor in our community? I truly believe it's opportunities. I don't think there's enough opportunities for families who um, fall below the poverty line. And that's where the biggest concern is because children, they are out on the streets or because you know their parents probably are having a problem trying to find jobs or uh, trying to, if they have some sort of uh, mental health concern or a drug concern that's causing most of these children to be out on the streets. That's why there's a higher number of children than there is adults because children are being neglected by their parents. There's not enough services, family services, to support the family and to keep the family together uh, to help parents work in this economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, among those poor young people or poor children, we know that there are so many who come from uh, immigrant families. Yes. So what would be your advice, both of you, in terms of uh, effort to address the issues affecting immigrant children or youth that are also poor? Of course, we have to address you know, the issues affecting all the poor children or young people. Completely. But uh, I, we know that immigrant people, on top of the other challenges that the other young people are facing, they are facing also additional challenges. 
what could you tell us in terms of you know, approach or effort to address the specific challenges affecting immigrant young people? So I'll share. Um, so Phipps Neighborhoods, as I mentioned, has an array of workforce programs. What we ended up doing a couple of months ago is to tap into the media. Um, so we invited Univision to come in to look at one of our workforce development programs called Career Network Healthcare. Um, and we were able to target a different community. And folks, lo and behold, saw us on TV and they ended up coming in. So I think that that allowed um, for us to just put things out there on a large base throughout the city. But more importantly, we have respective hubs throughout the Bronx. We have staff members that are bilingual that are able to address the needs of the community when they come in. And then we don't pride ourselves in being the end all be all for everyone. So we have partnerships like, for example, with the Bronx Immigration Partnership, where we're able to refer people to other organizations if they like, say they need a legal matter um, that's coming up. That's not something that we do. So we definitely um, believe in interagency and supporting each other so that we can address the needs of the community as they're coming up if we're not able to. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would say balance. Uh, the families uh, who are coming into this country, they have a dream, just like we all have a dream, to move, um, move forward in life and to grow as a family and to become more and, and to become a part of the community, and that's really all they want. So it's really important. Um, me, my grandfather, my father is actually a first-generation American, so I, I saw it growing up with my own grandfather. He had, a, he had to educate himself in his own country. He had to get over here. And then he, had to, he taught himself elementary level education just to end up going to college. And he came here with just a penny in his pocket. What helped him achieve his goals to have me here today uh, would be the fact that he had the community help him. Everything is about balance, and the community needs to balance out what we need to be there for support, whether it's with uh, helping with the education, helping with the family, uh, helping with the community around them, keeping them connected to here. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Miss uh, De La Hose, and thank you also, Miss uh, Welk. Thank you. And thank you for the wonderful job that you are doing on behalf of our children and our youth. But continue to do that, please. This is very important. You are making a, a wonderful, uh, a big difference in the life of so many children and youth. And it will take all of us, not only DYCD, not only you, but the, great, the, the, the government, the city of New York, everybody, we should team up in order to decrease or eliminate poverty, not only among our children, also our constituency. And I would like to uh, thank also DYCD for being here all the time, mm -hmm. even stay for the entire hearing. <laughs> thank you so much. And I appreciate that. And I know that you have been listening to the uh, testimony and the comments of uh, those one, two wonderful persons. And I know that you know uh, you will uh, convey, you will share with uh, the commissioner some of the comments. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to also to thank uh, you know, the staff of the community. Thank you very much. And the meeting is adjourned. And thank you also to the, to the other staff, those who make this possible. So thank you to all of you. Thank you.